all bring your agendas where you look at them. I'm going to talk for just a brief five minutes, and then we're going to go back to Mr. Zinke, who is the protocol commander of all of us. And then I'll be back in a few minutes later. So, let me just give you a brief history. Oh, there's this right here. I'll give you a brief history of the gardens. <laughs> from uh, Missouri, Ruth and Charles Larrabee. They purchased the land here. There were like 25 acres at the time, and they lived in a house. You'll see the house that they lived in, as you're touring the garden. They weren't real wealthy people, but they had enough money so that they could travel around, and they loved plants, so they would travel around and bring plants back here to the garden and plant them. And that's really how the garden got started. They lived here from uh, 43 to 47, at least Ruth lived here until 47. Well, Chuck left a little before then. So in 50, to 57, excuse me. So in 57, Ruth donated the gardens to the San Diego County. So the San Diego County loosely managed the area, and uh, a few things happened in between. But by 1993, the county of San Diego was getting a little tired of it, and they thought maybe it would make a good sports park or something. So some people came forward and started the um, San Diego the, the Quail Botanical Gardens Foundation. And that's what the county is still here. The county owns most of the land. The city owns some of the land, but it's managed by the Quail Botanical Gardens Foundation. And then in 2009, the name was changed from Quail Gardens to San Diego Botanic Gardens, and if it's a problem, get over it. <laughs> that was a long time ago. But you can still say quail, you know. So about the garden. There are 37 acres, and there are three different kinds of areas in the garden. The first one are geographic areas. Africa, Canary Islands, Chile, and some others. So when you go to the African section, most of the plants you see in the African section will be native to Africa. Or when you go to the Canary Islands. Do you know where the Canary Islands are? Little islands off the coast of Spain, between Spain and on um, Africa. So there's geographic areas. In addition, there are demonstration gardens. Uh, demonstration gardens such as bamboo. Rosie's, Rosie's Lumen plant is bamboo. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll be going through the bamboo forest, and you'll see bamboo from all over the world, not just from one geographic area, like not just bamboo from India all over the world. Uh, so this is the demonstration garden, subtropical fruit. We won't be visiting subtropical fruit today, but we'll just kind of walk by it briefly. They're just a little <coughs> time. And then there are some other areas of interest, uh, landscaping for fire safety display, children's gardens. I don't go to the children's gardens. I hear there are a lot of little things going around. <laughs> <laughs> We're not visiting the children's gardens today. Uh, so. There's a native area, look out in some of them. Um, there's so, um, staff. There are 15 administrative staff people in the gardens. There are um, 160 docents. I'm a docent. And your other tour guides, Linda, who's speaking today, we're all docents here. And there are, going to say, about 160 of those. And then volunteers. There are really 60 active, but probably a lot more volunteers. The difference between a volunteer and a docent, a volunteer, the only requirement is that they attend a volunteer orientation session, which is a few hours long. The docents, and they're not required to put any number of hours in a year. The docents, on the other hand, are trained in horticulture. We have about eight classes that they go through. We learn about plants. We learn about plant families. We do not learn about insects. We do not learn about pests, diseases, anything like that. It's pretty much strictly plants. And um, we are required to put in 80 hours a year. So in addition to the 
the easy 25 hours you do for master gardeners, you put in 80 hours when you're here, and usually much more than that. And by the way, you know, um, there's someone here whose mother, Thelma, was in the first class of 1982, the first Bilson class. Any idea who that is? He's smiling back there. Jeff's mom was in the very first docent class. And she is still a docent. <laughs> Next, Liz Ruzicki, our horticulture manager. I guess I should say just a, just a word or two. Liz came here as a, she became a docent in 2004, and she defected. <laughs> she became a staff member, and she is now the manager of Vertical. So she's been here as manager for 10 years. As manager, maybe more like eight. I have been here 12 years. Gardener started as a gardener, and um, came here from greenhouse production, actually. And so did a little career shift to go to landscape. So it's been a, it's been a wonderful 12 years here. And when Mo asked me to do a little introduction to you, you know, kind of what's going on in the garden these days, I started thinking about what does a gardener do here at a botanic garden? What's it like? What's it entail to be a gardener in a botanic garden? Um, so I thought I'd take you through a fictional day of a gardener. We have Chris Garcia here, um, who's one of our gardeners. He's been here about five years. And um, kind of use a day in the life as a jump off point to tell you expand on some of the things that are going on in the garden uh, that's been going on in the garden lately. Um, one thing I wanted to point out as a gardener here, one of the bonuses we get when we arrive at the garden, we get to kind of cruise around and see what's new and what's blooming. And what I had seen recently was our, our fire wheel tree down in the Australian garden. That's just a stunning plant. You have to kind of look up to see it, but it's a beautiful plant. And in our um, African bank garden, this is a species gladiola. So we're used to the really hybridized types that are huge and big and bossy. And this is this delicate little, really nice little flower that's, that was a gem to see. <clears throat> so a day in the garden. Gardeners will arrive with a plant. And with, um, with the recent rains, probably the focus these days has been on weeding. We haven't had a lot of rain, but you know, enough to get that belt grass going. And that's one of our primary weeds. So that's going to be the priority for the day, the belt grass. If it's not that weed, it's another weed that has taken over areas of the garden. I think it's even more noxious than the belt grass. It's called Nothoscordum gracilli. And I found this neat quote on the Pacific Bulb Society's website. It says, it is extremely prolific, invasive, and difficult to eradicate. And often seen in terrible gardens for this reason. Are you kidding me? <laughs> the flowers voice. Can I ask a question on it? Does sure. it smell like garlic? So, the it does not smell like garlic, hence the name false garlic. But the flowers you can see look like an onion family um, garlic. So it is in the alley family. It doesn't have any aroma. But it does have a bulb. It creates offsets very readily. They break off. They multiply prolifically. All of these patches you're seeing here are in our fruit garden. Um, so we're developing strategies to deal with this because it's really become a problem. Um, one of the first options, of course, well not the first, but we did some herbicide spray. And after about two weeks, it looks like, yeah, we think we may have got it under control. But when you look a little closer, you still see it hanging in there and growing. And after three weeks, I went back and said, all right, we've got it. But I'm leaving the sort of up there because I really think I'm waiting to see if something re-sprouts from all that energy in the pole from the ground. It may. Um, what sure. is it named to? Africa. It is an African pole. I think it's South Africa. Yeah. yeah. There are some very ornamental Nothoscordums, by the way. This one is the pest. So if you go on the Pacific Bulb Society website, you'll see some very pretty ones. 
and I guess one option for anyone like this is simply to embrace it and say, hey, yeah. I'm not there. <laughs> so uh, next, we're also trying some non-herbicide experiments. And you can see we uh, surrounded the root zone of the tree with some landscape fabric, so we're not smothering that root zone. And then we're going to try some black plastic, pin it down, and literally smother it. We're going to explode. We're going to extend this plastic back all the way to cover because there's a nice patch of there. So we'll extend this. Leave it in place a month, peek under it, see if anything's happening. Two months, but hopefully the goal will be to actually smother it, remove the plastic, and be able to mulch. Um, we're not trying to solarize. The bulb is at least six inches down. Um, so solarization would hit primarily the first grade, two or four, two to four inches. Plus we get this May gray. Where's the sun? So we're going for smothering, um, really just blocking out light. It's an experiment. We'll see. Go ahead. So is that canvas there that's protecting the root of the tree? Yes, it's a landscape fabric, so it's permeable. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that we're gonna watch the. Um, Alternative is, so this was a view that we had earlier, and this is that area cleaned up, which we then did put down a landscape fabric and mulch over. Again, similar, kind of trying to smother it out. I have a feeling this weed is strong enough it'll pop up through it. At least it slows it down, we'll see. It also, um, so again, we didn't block off the roots under this tree, and there's a little bit of that false garlic there. but. That lets us, if we want to go in and manually dig that out, it's a small area, or if we wanted to do a little herbicide spray on that, we're spraying a tiny area as opposed to spraying all of that. So it's a really good advantage for reducing our herbicide use in the garden. <clears throat> so, weeds. So Chris comes to the garden, he's got a plan, it's going to be weed control. But first you walk our areas, where all, all the gardens are assigned areas. So you walk your area, and you know what happens periodically is all of a sudden there's a detour, because there's a tree limb. <laughs> so this becomes a number one priority, because we have to get the sidewalk clear and make the garden safe for visitors. This is an erythrina that's behind the gazebo. They tend to be brittle, they tend to want to drop their limbs like this, so... Um, wasn't totally unexpected, but boy, that came down hard. Um, <clears throat> and use this as a kind of a lead-in to talk about, we've actually lost a number of trees in the garden in the past year. And it's been fairly sad. The major event was the windstorm that we had back in January. And we had two big Tory pines that just went over. The wind caught them, they're, they're planted on right through the middle of the garden, here we have a sandstone shelf. Tori's planted on the top of the sandstone shelf. These were plants we think probably planted in the Larrabee era, so they go back to the 1940s, 1950s. And the wind gust was just positioned correctly, took the canopy of that tree, two of them actually, and took it over. Um, in the same wind storm, uh, we also lost our big 100-year-old eucalyptus cladocalyx, I should call it for the abundance of eucalyptus, um, outside the Larrabee House. This was planted in, back in the 1917s or the 19-teens, so we think it's the oldest tree on the property. And we knew it was declining. <coughs> um, it had started to develop conks, the fruiting um, mushroom, the, the shelf that grows outside, you see it at the base of the tree. Mm -hmm. So we had those analyzed, we had arbors come in and look at the tree, and yes, it had a heart rot. It was a heart rot that is typical for you to get, but the bad news was, once you see the conks on the outside, that means the heart rot had been in there for several years, if not longer. So we knew we had it in, as a plan, it was going to have to go. Um, but the arborists who came in to assess our Tories that went down took one look at that <coughs> eucalyptus and said it started to lift right along this uphill base here. We shut down the area below that, get that tree out. So within two days we had cranes, 
arborists um, take home actually down. And you can see, so they cut it about the limit of my picture here. But you also see, like you would this do, it's a sprout. And so our last step here was girdling the tree. So this line here is a chainsaw cut that goes all the way around the circumference of the tree to get into that cambium layer. Um, Brian Bishop was our arborist, and he has a special sauce that he sprayed on that to help kill the tree. You can see that works. There's a lot of energy still left in there. What I've noticed is that it has stopped putting out new growth, but it hasn't moved. That new growth hasn't died back yet. We're seeing. Um, like any time you lose big trees, especially big old trees, it's really kind of sad. But it's also an opportunity. Gardens evolve. They're always changing. And so we're looking at where the Tories were. The two that came down, that's our South Pacific Garden area. And so that's going to let in more light so we can try some different plants there and really expand what's planted there. It's a great opportunity. And where the eucalyptus is, um, right on the corner there is our Madagascar garden. And it's always been this tiny little corner right between the Larrabee House and the gift shop. So now we have an opportunity to expand some plantings into this eucalyptus zone. So gardens evolve, and some of our garden evolution that's gone on through the year, um, just to tell you a little bit more about that, we've been, um, Chris Garcia, whose photo you saw earlier, has developed a passion for California natives. And so he's been redoing a lot of our California gardenscapes trying new plants there and trying to really give people a, a view of what's possible in a landscape with California natives. Some just um, nice plants, some a little bit unexpected. Who would think to plant a thistle? You know, normally that's a bad plant, but this is a California thistle with its beautiful gray foliage, nice red flower. So really a great accent plant in the landscape. And he's also redone so those thistle are in this um, rock garden that he's developed along the path that goes down to the Hamilton Children's Garden. And Mo has told me that this will be on your tour route to be able to see this garden when you go and see what he's been doing with that area. And then we also have um, in our Australian garden, Paul Redker, our um, director of horticulture, he's been working in the Australian garden with the gardeners that are assigned there and added uh, a footpath through the garden. This has been great because a lot of the Australian garden has been big acreage and you saw it from outside looking in. So now it's just really, really nice to see visitors meandering through this path and going through the garden and enjoying the new plantings there. And I have to point out one new plant that's the hot plant for the year, I think, and um, one of my favorites. It's the Acacia Cousin It. <laughs> you can see why it's called that. It's a, it's a ground cover acacia, but it looks, uh, a lot of people mistake it for a, a grass or a type of bamboo. But it's the acacia cognata, which is normally a tree. This selection actually stays low and will spread on the ground. Very cool. I hope you guys get around to see that one. So Chris has got the garden cleaned up. The path is safe for visitors, so he's back to his priority. Well, you know, tree limbs fall down. Typically, you end up with broken irrigation heads. Uh, right? Water conservation, we have to get this fixed so that we're not wasting water. Um, this head actually broke down in our Australian area when um, we had an Arbor Day event, and we had 30 arbors here helping us out in the garden, which was great. We had a eucalyptus down there that had time, so they took that out. And yes, broke a few irrigation heads. And, um, the nice thing is this gives us an opportunity to change out this older style head with a newer, more water efficient irrigation head. We typically use MP rotators here in the garden. They're a low volume spray head, and that lower volume that it puts out lets the water soak into the ground slower. It's out less water, it soaks into the ground so you have less runoff. So much better for our water conservation for the garden. Um, and our other big water conservation effort that we're pursuing uh, right now is expanding our recycled water use. So 
So we've got about a third of the garden under recycled water, maybe a little more with what we have in Hamilton. Um, we're going to expand that into our Canary Island, the gazebo lawn area, and um, the landscape surrounding the gazebo lawn. We just had a landscape architect here because we have to do a plan for that, submit it to the Water Authority, and hopefully that will get underway. Uh, if not this summer, in the fall. I have to juggle around weddings here. It's kind of interesting. What's purple water compared to gray water? Hmm? Oh, purple pipe. Purple pipe. So anything that's recycled water is designated by um, purple pipe. Our irrigation heads marked are marked with a purple label. Um, and we'll have signage out. There are restrictions on when you can use this water, but there are no restrictions on how much of it you can use. So this becomes a more reliable source of water for us for the garden, so a more secure source. Where precisely does it come from? Um, hmm, there's all of these water authorities, water authorities, so I'm not quite sure where it's produced. It's piped from somewhere else. It is piped from somewhere else. So there are pipes that are now coming along uh, Royal Gardens Drive. And that's why that zone of the garden has been the easiest for us to actually get it into the garden loose. And you have to do a complete turnover. You can't have any connection, obviously, to potable water. So they come through annually um, and do a test. They actually um, look at our system annually to make sure that there are no cross connections or any problems. Most of the plants don't mind it. We've had a few that we've noticed, yeah, and, yeah not too happy with it. But <laughs> overall, I think it's been a good thing for the garden. We'll avoid using it in our fruit garden, herb garden, anywhere that might be in edibles. But it's fine for a lawn, fine for yeah, things like that. Do you know how it's treated? The water? Um, Does anybody? What's the question? How it's treated up through the. The, the final treatments that you get in your drinkable water. In other words, it doesn't go through a tertiary treatment. Mm -hmm. so I got information on that. Later. Primary, secondary, but not the tertiary treatments. Yeah. yeah. Um, we can't run it during the day when visitors are present. They don't want it to come into contact with anyone for the health reasons. Mm -hmm. We play around with it all the time. It's fine. But they have to be ultra careful. So. Let's see, so we got the water fixed, the tree cleared out. You think Chris will get back to his main priority? Because yeah. as he's looking around after he fixed it, he looks down on the ground and sees an accession tag line. So an accession tag, what's that? We're a museum for plants. So like any museum, we catalog our plants. So we have an active plant record system and our significant plants are given a unique identifying number. So that particular tag has a number on it that says 93.1073S1. So this indicates the plant came in in 1993, that's the year, and it was the 1,073rd plant that year, so it's just a sequential number. Um, but it is a unique identifier. S1 means it came from C. We have others that will say P or C for cutting. So we have plant records. Um, this could have been a plant that died. So, or it could be occasionally these tags um, move. And they get misplaced. So it becomes a research project for the gardener to find out where this plant is or where the tag should be. <laughs> now, most of us, Chris is who would what we call our Zen gardener. Most of us aren't quite the Zen gardener that Chris is. He could probably sit and meditate on that tag and find out where the plant is in the garden. You know, the rest of us, we have to use the more traditional tools of the trade. So we go to our plant records. This is a screenshot of the uh, FileMaker database that we have. And it shows a few of the data that we track for um, our significant plants in the garden. Obviously, if it's a petunia or an annual like corn that red plants, um, we're not going to track it with an accession number. Uh, but it will do the unique, the unique number, the accession number, and these aren't quite readable, but uh, the plant name, really important is the source. 
and the location of the garden. These are all from Madagascar, and we've been looking at these again because we're hoping to expand that garden here. Uh, we'll also include either in the source or in the notes if it's wild collected, potentially. And that may track back to, we get plants donated from the Huntington. Well, they may have wild collected it, so then that record has to follow that plant through. And that's very important for any botanic garden for the plant conservation that we're all, that's one of our um, missions. So this will tell the general area that the garden is in. Um, you may need to pinpoint it a little better than that, and then we can go to our garden maps. Uh, this is a, a geographic information system that we've been developing with the help of one volunteer we love. <laughs> um, but again, this is a map of our Madagascar garden. You can see the Larrabee house is here, and then this is the road, so this corner is the garden. Big star, uh, red star, is that big eucalyptus. So what we have are, we mark landmark plants. So the gardener can take this as a printout, key in on the landmark plant, and, and at least visually say, all right, that plant should be 10 feet over this direction. And it's very helpful locating plants. So once Chris is located where the plant should be, determine if the tag needs to be moved to the plant, or if the plant's dead, eventually that'll make it back around to our plant records. It switches from living to dead. So that's, yeah, um, plant records and the gist of that. Three detours through the day, that about kills the day. <laughs> and Chris is going, yeah, but what about that pesky patch of grass? <laughs> no, well, that's tomorrow's priority. <laughs> So with, for example, that it's a dead plant, do you try to get another one? Do you say, wait, that one's gone? It depends on if we have duplicates of it. Okay. Um, it. It all depends on the plant, really. A okay. uh, goal would be if it's if it's a, one of our um, collections, we have five primary collections. We're building that to seven. But if it's, for instance, a cycad, um, many times we have duplicates back in the nursery, kind of as a backup. Um, or we have sources that we might be able to get them from. So yeah, we want to keep our collection as large as we can. Any other questions or comments? Thank you all. Enjoy your day in the garden.